We just take the annual poverty estimates that are released by the United States every fall, usually in September, and, and, and break it out for three groups. Um, uh, seniors, that's the red line. Um, children, that's real important, the blue line, and then the dashed blue line being everybody else, uh, adults that are, that are not seniors. You can see that the basic trend going on Taking, uh, putting aside seniors for just a moment, shows that you know we had this period in the early, in the 60s, and a little bit through the 70s where we saw some real improvements uh, in the in, in poverty rates. But that since that time, um, there's cycles. Uh, poverty goes down in strong economic periods, like the late 1960s, uh, uh, 90s. It goes up in adverse economic times, like the Great Recession, it's very cyclical. But sort of abstracting from the cyclical elements, what you can see is, if anything, it looks like the poverty rate of children is sort of going up a bit, um, certainly not going down. Um, and, and, and the same, but to a, at a lower rate and to a lesser extent, you see that for adults. <laughs> Interestingly, and in contrast to that, you, and that's not really going to be the subject of the talk, but you can see that the, the poverty rate for seniors looks a bit better, both in terms of the rate is lower, but also you see a more steady rate of improvement. Um, and in fact, back in the early 60s when we first started measuring poverty, and unfortunately the numbers just weren't broken down uh, by all these detailed age groups at the very beginning, uh, seniors actually had the highest poverty rates in America. And it's a very different picture today, um, with children having the highest rates of poverty in America today. And I'm sure everybody in this room sort of knows these, these basic facts. And while not the subject of today's conversation, uh, the main source for the, for the improvement in the financial and poverty well-being of seniors is almost purely due to Social Security. And so it's just sort of an interesting kind of counterpoint to the statement that you know, policy is ineffective, that very clearly um, the gains in income for the elderly or the, the fall in poverty rates is because Social Security, well, first of all, really expanded in this period. The generosity of the program increased. But by definition, it's a program that basically keeps up with basic wages and costs of living by its very structure. So this, my, my research and my focus today is really about the non-elderly, but it's really important from the onset just to see the differences in order to understand the basic landscape of uh, poverty and well-being in the United States. So that's official poverty, and we measure official poverty um, in a, what everybody agrees is a very outdated way. And so there's a couple of key limitations to this measure that we've been tracking for all this period of time. First of all, uh, how, de poverty, ge generally speaking, is defined as you add up all the income of people in the household or the family, uh, and you compare that to some poverty threshold that varies by how many people there are in the family. And that threshold is adjusted year to year based on average prices. That's basically how we calculate poverty. Well, interestingly, we only count today in official poverty cash income in the household. So for example, notably, uh, one important source of income for lower income families in the United States is food stamps, or SNAP, or in California, CalFresh. Technically, uh, CalFresh, or SNAP, is a voucher. It's not cash. So technically, and in the definition of poverty in America, SNAP benefits are not counted as income. Neither are other important in-kind benefits like housing subsidies or the many other ways in which social safety net programs increase family incomes. Secondly, it's also a pre-tax measure of income. Um, and importantly, for the low-income population, uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit is the most important anti-poverty program in the United States. And interestingly, as is being debated right now, again, in Sacramento as to whether the state is going to add a, a state EITC. And that's where I want to end today, is to just talk about the Earned Income Tax Credit. But the Earned Income Tax Credit is not pre-tax pre income, and so the Earned Income Tax Credit is also 
not included as income. So step one is to just understand that this measure of poverty doesn't include these important elements of the safety net and over this period of time, at least beginning in the mid to late 1970s, essentially all the growth of the social safety net for families and children in the United States has taken place outside cash income. So it's been very much the growth of in-kind benefits through SNAP, through Medicaid, uh, or what's Medi-Cal in California, as well as the movement away from cash welfare and towards in-work benefits like the Earned Income Tax Credit that, have, that has been the, you know, the central focus of anti-poverty policy since Bill Clinton's uh, welfare reform in 1996. And so this is important because as time has passed, this measure of official poverty has gotten more and more detached from what actual resources that families have available to them. So, and, and, and so that's one big criticism of official poverty. The second, is, which is particularly relevant for the state in which we live, is the cost of living. So the poverty threshold, so again, poverty is basically you count the income and you say is it above or below a poverty threshold, that in official poverty statistics varies only by how large your family is, and not, notably, by the cost of living of where you live. So it's also been long time criticism of the official poverty rate that the, the threshold that resources are compared to does not vary with the, with the local cost of living. It only varies in an aggregate way uh, with the cost of living. So about three years ago, the census released not a replacement for the official poverty rate, but an additional measure called the supplemental poverty measure measure, and that is too released in the fall, although a couple of months after the official poverty uh, rate. It's really primarily for political reasons that we've not replaced the official poverty with the supplemental poverty threshold. There are just too many sources of income between levels of government that are geared to the poverty rate in order to make it possible, I think, politically, to do that replacement. Though we have what everybody can sort of agree is you know, before the supplemental poverty measure, all sorts of different people would measure their own poverty rates. Hillary Hoynes did it her way, and other scholars did it their way, and it was always easy to just kind of not have a gold standard, and now we do, and I think that's really important. So if we take this new supplemental poverty measure that we've only been measuring since 2011 and use the best existing data we have to sort of backcast that in time, this is what we get. So this is for uh, all people. I don't have this here broken down um, by age. The, um, the blue dotted line is official poverty. And it's what I just showed you, it just, because it starts in 1967, it's, you sort of catch it only, and you don't see the big decline in the beginning, so it looks a bit different. And it's for all persons, not broken up by group, but it's exactly the same information. And the same takeaway is that it goes up and goes down in cycles. If anything, might be going up a little bit, but certainly it's not going down. That's what we saw before. So now, in contrast, once we introduce this new supplemental poverty measure, we can see that there's a bit more optimism, maybe, in looking at it. It looks like, again, um, the poverty rate goes down in good times and goes up in bad times. but it looks like maybe there's a little bit more of a relationship that over time it might be going down a bit. Um, and notably, um, uh, the official, uh, the supplemental poverty measure, and I'll talk about this at the very end, shows that in the Great Recession, so this increase right here in official poverty in the Great Recession, one would expect that in bad times poverty is going to go up. And interestingly, very much in large part because of how many households were reached by the SNAP or food stamp program, the, the supplemental poverty measure shows much less in the way of increases in poverty in the Great Recession. And I'm going to sort of end up, and when I'm talking about the efficacy of policy at the end, I'll talk about that a little bit more, in a little bit more, um, I'll start focusing in on that a little bit more. 
extremely importantly, uh, when we get to looking at uh, the supplemental poverty measure what, and look at poverty rates by state, where we now have the poverty threshold that varies with the cost of living in the state, a very important result is that our state of California goes from being about a middle poverty state, by official poverty statistics, to being the highest poverty state, uh, this is child poverty, highest child poverty state in the United States. Um, and I actually, interestingly, had a conversation with the, who's the most famous graduate of this fine institution? The boss. the boss, Jerry Brown. Um, I got a call from Jerry Brown. Well, someone gave him my name. I that I should he should talk to me to understand why it is that when we moved to this new measure, suddenly California was the highest poverty state in the United States. And he was apparently asked this in a press conference and didn't have any ideas. Um, so anyways, we had an interesting conversation about the cost of living and how that feeds into poverty and, and what is sort of behind why that, why, why that occurred. But that's an important part of the context of um, this new measure. So putting that aside for a second, uh, having in your mind this idea about what's happened to poverty rates over time, let's now look at the other end of the distribution and look at, um, at inequality. Um, and in particular, my colleague Emmanuel Saez and his very famous uh, co-author, uh, Thomas Piketty, have been for years developing a world database that measures um, um, the amount of resources in the economy that are held by the, the most advantaged or the, the richest or the highest income groups. And just as a, a bit of a side note, what they did was, was really brilliant. People had been measuring inequality for hundreds of years. Um, but for the most part, the standard kinds of data that one uses um, to measure this, and the same data that I use to measure these poverty rates, are government survey data where you might have in your sample 60,000 households each month and you get information about them. If you're trying to count the amount of money that accrues to the top 1% of households, having a sample of 60,000 is not very big. And um, furthermore, given that income is so skewed, you really need to dig down into those highest income groups in order to get just your, your aggregate measures right. So they did something quite brilliant, and that is go to tax data. Tax data is not perfect, but tax data includes everybody who has high incomes, and it turns out that, you know, as long as a country has an income tax, in the United States, we started the income tax in 1914, the federal income tax in order to pay for World War I, that's when we started a federal income tax in the United States, we've, we've got good data on, in the aggregate, the amount of income that's earned by people in higher income groups. And so they have this great website that I urge you to visit if you haven't gone. It, and they're slowly trying to get data on as many countries as they can to build this world database of inequality. Um, and it's not going to be good for measuring poverty because you need to be in the tax system in order to, to, to be a source of their data. So it's a, it's a project that's focused on upper tail inequality, incomes at the high end um, rather than income at the low end. But I bring this up because it's part of a bigger story about what's going on. Poverty and inequality, you can't think of one without the other or upper tail inequality. Okay, so this is the, 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 the kind of graph that is very illustrative of what's going on for the United States that Piketty and Sias have produced. So going back to uh, 1913, um, we have this data on aggregate incomes in the United States. The black line tells you what share of the total income from these tax records is held by the top 1% of um, income earners. And just for a form of reference, in 2013, the last year in their data, the top 1% is at $392,000 a year. That's the cutoff to get to the top 1%. The blue and the red lines give you the share of folks <laughs> that have income in the remainder of the top 5% after the one and then between the 5 and the 10%. So it's very much focusing in on what is happening to the kind of aggregate earning of the top of the income distribution. 
And so with this kind of long period of time, um, Piketty and Saya sort of break it down into these three different time periods. The first time period, um, up and through um, the Great Depression, um, is known as the era of the, of the Great Compression, where incomes were, were moving together and the kind of growth uh, of the middle class. And so the amount of income held by the most the highest income Americans was declining over t as a share of total income. Then we've got this very long period of time, uh, sort of uh, after uh, World War II and, and through the early 70s, where things were pretty stable. Um, and, and in fact, what was going on in this time period was a fair amount of uniform growth across the earnings distribution. Um, there was gains and earnings at the top, and there was gains and earnings at the bottom. So if you look at the share of income held by these top groups, it was relatively stable. Um, and then, of course, we've got the more recent period of time uh, where we see this steady increase in income being held by the very top, the top 1%. Um, it really striking even relative to the blue dots, which is the amount of income held by between the two and the 5% top, which still seems pretty high. So that's your basic um, fact on inequality. And one um, statement about policy here before going on to talk about the labor market is that to the best evidence of the scholars that work on this issue, Generally speaking, the decline in this beginning period and the stable period were relatively common across countries. So just to show you this data for a few more countries, on the left-hand side, we've got these classic English-speaking countries, the United States, UK, and Canada. And on the right-hand side, a couple of counterexamples, um, notably France, Japan, and Sweden. And the point here is to say that all of these countries showed these declines in this early part of the period, and all of these countries showed more of a stable period after that. But in the last regime um, or era of this data, the English-speaking countries' inequality is going up, and the most in the United States, but not so across the board. So, what this reveals is that it can't be purely global forces that are explaining these trends. Otherwise, we would expect to be seeing it in all countries and not just in the United States. And one of the most important facts about this is the relationship between inequality at the very top and the amount of progressive taxation in our income tax schedule. So this shouldn't be purely convincing, but it is sort of um, tantalizingly correlational that in this last period of time, we've seen this massive increase in the amount of income at the very top and a really sharp decline in the amount of taxation at the very top. And you can see that not a very long time ago, the United States had, so just to get, your, to get the scale right here, the red line is the the highest marginal tax rate in the US federal income tax system. And the scale is on the right. So not a very long time ago, back here in say 1963, when the first, basically the first modern tax reform was under Kennedy, uh, the marginal tax rates were, the highest marginal tax rate was almost 90% in the United States. Probably most people don't know that, it was pretty high. Um, and you can see against that backdrop by how much it's gone down. So we could take that information and look at it slightly more systematically and look across countries. And again, this is still kind of correlational, but I think our best evidence suggests that the behavior is consistent with these rather simple pictures. On the left side, we've got a, a scatter plot by country, so each dot is a country. And the x-axis is what is the top marginal tax rate, and the higher that is, the more progressivity, the more your trying to you know, get more income from the highest income taxpayers. And the y-axis is how much income is held by that top 1%. Okay, so it's that black line from the first inequality graph, this one. 
And we can look at that across countries. And the interesting thing, just in the context of America, is that on the left-hand side, we've got this period of time in the early 60s. And on the right-hand side, today. In both of these figures, it seems kind of clear that the higher the marginal tax rate, the lower the amount of income held at the very top. It kind of almost has to be true in some way. Um, and the same thing uh, in the current period. But from the interesting uh, United States perspective, in the early 1960s, we were actually a pretty high, we had a very progressive income tax system compared to all these other countries and a kind of middle of the road amount of inequality. Whereas today, um, we're now the lowest marginal tax rate on the top incomes and the highest level of inequality. So this sort of striking increase in inequality, most scholars agree, is in part driven, not fully of course, by the lower amount of taxation at the top. So I bring that up only to point out the obvious that policy can do something about it um, should we want to do that. So that sort of gives us the basic facts about poverty and inequality. So let's sort of step back and relate this to what we know about what's happening in the labor market. Because the labor market is, you know, most people's income is labor income. So if we learn what's going on in the labor market, we'll learn a lot about what's happening in terms of poverty and inequality. Um, so the sum of those two concerns or kind of facts about the, about the labor market implies that family incomes are just not increasing much if you have below median family income. So knowing what's happening in the labor market is critical for understanding what's happening to poverty. And the sort of takeaway is that Poverty is not going down mostly because wages are not going up. And anybody who knows anybody who's trying to live on a limited amount of income, that shouldn't be a very shocking point. And so the real question is, well, why aren't wages showing an increase? But let's first just see what the facts are. So this is men. This is um, in real terms, so in uh, fixed dollars. What is happening to hourly wages and it showed back to 1979, where all of these trends are just relative to what it was in 1979. And it's showing the contours of this over time separately uh, for the 10th percentile of the distribution of wages. So you take wages of all men, um, and you take the 10th percentile and plot that over time. The 20th percentile, the median, et cetera. And so what you can see is that all of these lines, the median and below, are below this zero line, which means wages are lower than 1979. Lower wage levels. And of course, the flip side of that, and part of what we see in terms of the increase in inequality, is the more striking growth uh, at the higher end of the, of the distribution of wages. That's for men. Uh, if we look for women at the story for women, as I said, it's a little bit less um, depressing. Um, though at the, at the end of the day, we're still not seeing much gain in wages or any gain at the bottom of the distribution. And the thing that makes this graph a little bit harder to interpret is that back in 1979, many fewer women were participating in the labor market and today, there's many more. So it's a little bit more confusing to say, well, who is the 10th percentile person and how is that changing over time? And so that just makes these a little bit trickier, but nonetheless, it's just sort of a fact. So, the, the, so I mentioned that there were two things, changes in wages and changes in employment rates. This gives you a little bit of an idea about how much the United States has changed recently um, in terms of our um, overall connection to the labor market. So this just takes people of prime age, 25 to 54. I myself am going to turn 54 next year, so I'm almost at the end of prime age. It's very exciting, I guess. Um, and it just says, what share of people are employed or looking for work, unemployed? And the blue, light blue line is the United States. And what you can see, and this is for men on the left and women on the right, and so you can see that 
we've just had this quite steady decline in labor force participation rates for men that's been going on for a while. And I'll have to admit, I had not really noticed until, you know, this is from the economic report of the president. This is recent. Um, I saw a talk about six months ago. I was kind of embarrassed. I didn't know this fact. But women are now sort of on that same trajectory in the United States. And so if you go back to the early 90s, the United States had one of the highest labor force participation rates of women compared to our kind of uh, rich country uh, colleagues. And now we have a very, a pretty low one. So you can just see we're sort of starting to really deviate from trend. And I think this is, this trend is in part, I think why like the president's budget and last you know, State of the Union address was all about this issue of middle class economics and, and, and a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here is precisely, I think, motivating um, the interest in, in these issues. So if you put this together, if you put wages plus employment together and say, well, what's happening to family income as a whole, you see the following. So if you take family income and all families and put them into five categories, quintiles, the lowest quintile, the bottom fifth, the second fifth, and so on, and say, what's happened to average earnings, uh, average income within that group? Between the light bar is between 1973 and just around the Great Recession, and the dark bar is that kind of period of time after the war up till 1973, where we had this period, remember, of this kind of steady, uh, kind of um, the, the share of income at the top of the distribution was relatively steady. What we see then is in this earlier period, we had pretty substantial growth across all family income. So the bottom fifth family income grew by, you know, doubled in real terms, and the top fifth, uh, it went up by 90%. So this was this period of sort of shared prosperity. Yet in the more recent time period, we see a very different pattern where, you know, there's a lot of gains at the top that, you know, actual declines in real terms at the bottom. And so that is just by way of saying that when the labor market is not keeping up with prices, um, that is the most important determinant of what's happening in, with respect to poverty. And so, you know, without gains in the labor market at the bottom of the income distribution, we're not going to see improvement in poverty. And policy can only be so, so effective in order to try to fight against those trends. So from a bigger, I spend a fair amount of my time trying to con, try to talk people through, sometimes reporters, the fact that, you know, the poverty rate hasn't gone down. It doesn't mean our policies are ineffective. The question is, what would have happened if those policies weren't in place? Things would be a lot worse. And so that's a kind of counterfactual statement that's kind of hard, you know, it's hard to do. It's hard to do as science and it's hard to communicate. Uh, but that's the right question to be asking, I think, um, in terms of evaluating policy. So behind these trends in, in, um, in the labor market are what we know is going on for returns to skill. And I thought it would be useful to just give a little bit of a primer on this. And this is not my research. This is mostly work by David Otter, Larry Katz, and others who are really doing the best work on this, on this topic. But I thought that just putting up these trends and what's happening by group, it's useful to sort of describe what I think we know about why it is that there, that there, that there aren't gains at the bottom, what's happening. So just to describe that a little bit, here's um, a really important kind of graph. And we spent a lot of time as labor economists talking about <clears throat> the returns to skill. What does that mean? That means if I'm thinking about obtaining a college degree, what could I expect to earn compared to if I don't seek that college degree? Mm -hmm. So this graph on the right is just that. It's what is the average earnings of someone with a college degree relative to the average earnings of someone with a high school diploma or no more, and how it looks over time. And the striking thing about this kind of L-shaped curve here is that up until, remember that kind of time period where things started to change in the early to mid 1970s, this, you know, of course you're gonna earn more in college than in, 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 than in high school. Um, those that obtain a college degree compared to those who 
obtain just a high school degree. But the striking thing is since about 1980, that return to skill, or premium as we call it, has just been steadily increasing. And we can think about understanding why that steady increase is going on unabated, coming back to sort of the basics of supply and demand. I think there's a lot of power in explaining this uh, with supply and demand. But before I do that, another way to look at this pattern is instead of looking at the ratio, you can just look at the, at the gap, the amount of earnings that people with a college degree earn minus the amount of earnings that people with a high school degree earn. And what you can see is that that gap between 1979, when this sort of pivot takes place, has gone up tremendously. So in, in constant dollars at a household level, just the takeaway is that in 2012, two college-educated workers in a family would earn $58,000 a year more than uh, those with a high school degree in 2012. And back in 1979, in the same dollars, the difference was only 20000 So it's just another way of saying that if you have a college degree, what you're going to earn relative to your uh, counterpart who only has a high school degree is more, and it's a lot more today than it was. And so why is that so high and not going down? So we can sort of just simply, very simply break this up to supply and demand. Essentially what we know on the demand side is that there's been a steady sort of increase in demand for skilled workers. And those increases in demand for skilled workers is in part coming from technological change, um, as well as issues around globalization. So that is leading to a sort of steady increase in demand for skilled workers. And so if that were the only story, supply stays constant, demand goes up, prices are going to get pushed up. And so the price of a skilled worker compared to an unskilled worker is going to go up. But usually, if supply goes up, it could sort of counteract that. But it turns out, and this is kind of maybe surprising to many, that educational attainment, the, the fraction of Americans that are getting a college degree, is going up, but the rate of growth is really slowed. And so the bottom line of all of that is there's a steady demand for increase in skills, and there's not, supply isn't going out fast enough to keep up with demand. And so the net result of that is that the price of a college education, the price that we receive in the labor market, if we have one, is going up and up and up. Because supply is not going out enough fast enough to meet demand. And so you can just sort of see what that, what that looks like. And it might be a little bit hard to see on this graph. This is just <clears throat> how, um, how, what share of folks uh, have a college degree. And it was sort of going up more steeply until this early 80s period. And then it sort of, it didn't go to zero, it didn't go down, but the rate of growth slowed. And it might be a little bit hard to see that graph, so you can sort of zero in a little bit more if you look at um, younger workers, where, you know, the, the new cohort of younger workers enters the labor market every year, and you can just sort of zero on, in on this a little bit closer. So here, again, it's men more than women, but the dark blue line shows the share of men um, uh, with a, a college degree relative to a high school degree among men that have less than 10 years of experience in the labor market, so recent entrants. And you can really see this sort of flattening. So educational attainment is slowed for men, significant. And so that's part of the story for why, that's part of what the labor economists conclude is the story about the, the steady increase in wages at the top compared to the middle is because of this increasing returns to skill which is a function of this lack of increase in the supply of educated workers relative to the demand just going up and up. So that's a sort of very brief summary of what we know about what's behind those trends in wages. Um, in addition to the fact that the premium to a college degree is going up and not going down, it's also the case, as I showed you, that the wages in absolute terms for the less skilled are going down. So
So what do we think is going on that describes that? And here's where technological changes we've already talked about. But in addition, essentially what we have is, is policies are becoming less effective. The role of unions and minimum wages have declined. And in addition to the technological forces in the economy, we have these strong global forces that are you know, essentially removing a lot of what were middle class jobs in America. And so the net result of this is what's, um, I'll show you, and I'll come back to that, is what labor economists are calling polarization of the labor market. So polarization meaning we've got strength in the number of jobs at the bottom of the skill distribution, or low wage jobs, and we've got growth in jobs of high wage jobs, but there's not many jobs in the middle. And so you can see this um, in, a, in a couple of graphs. So on the x-axis here is um, a ranking of jobs based on average kind of wages in the job. And the y-axis is how, where is employment growing in the economy? And the light, the dark, um, um, wait a second, what do I want to show here? What I want to show is in the light green line sort of illustrates it most compellingly that in the middle of the distribution, we don't have much gain in jobs. So middle income jobs. We've got gains in jobs in the bottom, and we've got gains in jobs at the top. Um, and th in fact, in this earliest period, 79 to 89, um, there was kind of less gains at the bottom. So this polarization is described as not many gains in jobs in the middle. And if we step back, and compare the United States to other countries, we see this is not just a phenomenon going on in the United States. So here is a description of you know, many other OECD countries, and, um, or I guess EU, just EU, and the United States is over here by comparison. And each one of these bars, the green bar is again that middle, middle income, middle wage jobs how many jobs are growing in the economy uh, for those, uh, for the middle, versus the bottom, that's the dark blue one, and the green is the top. And so what you can see is across pretty much all of these countries, we're not generating many jobs in the middle. Right, so this polarization is something that's going on across many countries. Um, so the United States, you know, we're, we're growing jobs at the bottom and we're growing jobs at the top, or, you know, top, bottom, bottom third, middle third, top third, but we're not growing many in the middle. So the, 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 the end result of that is there's opportunities for, for, for advancement at the top, but there's not much of a way to get advancement out from the bottom to the middle because there's not as many jobs being generated in that range. So, this was admittedly a really short sort of description of what we think we know is going on in terms of the labor market. Um, but it sort of backs up the, the, the facts about poverty, especially, to not just about policy, which of course I think is very important, but what's more important is wages. Because most people who are poor are working. Um, and so their income is largely determined by what wages they can get in the labor market. And that's kind of an obvious statement, but one that we often kind of forget um, in our kind of focus on, well, how, why aren't these policies working? We're pouring all these money into these anti-poverty programs, but poverty is still high. That's because these forces are pushing down wages. And if we didn't have the social safety net on top of it, poverty would be going up by a lot more than it is. That's sort of the takeaway. So, you know, so with that, with this statement about what's happening in the labor market, and especially this issue about the skill premium going up and up, um, what that basically says is that our economy can absorb a lot more skilled workers than it has right now. So, so what do we do about that? So, I, I want to finish my, my talk by, by just pointing out sort of the obvious, which is 
the policy solutions that are aimed at what we call pre-market. So what would we change? What kinds of policies would we want to push on in order to try to affect those trends in the economy? To try to change the amount of wages that workers can earn in the labor market. And so, you know, we're not going to be able to turn back globalization. That is, that's happening. Um, and all countries are being affected by it. What, we, what I think everybody kind of agrees is the, the, the best course to go is to work towards increasing the number of skilled workers in our economy. And so that's where you get to uh, a lot of argument about promoting skills, uh, increasing human capital all the way from preschool through uh, through college degrees. And then sort of on top of that, um, you know, promoting um, changes in the labor market through uh, greater efforts towards unionization to try to increase the bargaining power of workers, as well as obviously the, the, the dramatic kind of movement that are going, that's going on across cities in the United States in terms of increasing minimum wages and not waiting for federal policy to do so, uh, that's another kind of obvious um, uh, takeaway for this. Um, but before ending, I did want to sort of talk about something that's a little bit closer to, to what I do and what I study, and that is, given the existing labor market as it is, you know, we have a social safety net. And what elements of the social safety net are the most important right now for trying to fill that bucket, trying to make up um, for the income that's lost because of the lack of um, returns in the labor market for low-skilled workers? And it's unambiguously, at least in the context of families and children, which I study, not, not seniors, is the earned income tax credit. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the earned income tax credit. And as I said earlier, um, it's, it's, I think, maybe for the fourth time being advanced in Sacramento uh, as a possible uh, state earned income tax credit. So the main policy is federal, although about half the states now have add-ons to the federal earned income tax credit as part of their state income tax system. So I want to talk about the EITC because it addresses both of those twin concerns in the labor market, falling wages and falling employment. And so the earned income tax credit has been around since 1975, but really wasn't sort of turned into an active social policy until 1986, actually, interestingly, under Ronald Reagan. Um, and the program was expanded, um, that should say 1986, not, not uh, 96. So the program was expanded in 86, it was also expanded under, under the first uh, George Bush in 1990. The biggest expansion was under Clinton in 93, and then again under the second Bush in, in 2002, and then finally in, as part of the stimulus package in 2009. So it's been expanded several times. It's a tax credit, a refundable tax credit, which means that you can get a tax refund. So a non-refundable tax credit can only reduce your taxes owed to zero, and that's it. A refundable tax credit can reduce your taxes below zero and, and give you a tax payment. And so most of the payments in the EITC take the form of a tax refund. So for the 2004 tax year, you can see that if you had a family with two children and earned, say, $15,000 a year, you would have a tax credit of over $5,000. So certainly relative to your income level, and I say 15,000 because that's about minimum wage full-time worker, that's about what you earn per year. And so on top of that, a $5,000 tax credit is, is a big share of your income, obviously. And you can see that the tax schedule is, you know, the, the credit is more generous if you have more children. Um, there's a very small credit for families without children, and, and this is one of the few elements that it seems like there's bipartisan support on is federally, is expanding the childless EITC in part because of what I'm about ready to tell you about how successful this program has been towards these two concerns about decline in employment and decline in, in family incomes. But you can see that the credit is pretty generous and extends up to income of about $40,000 a year. If you have children and have income below $40,000 a year, 
you'll be eligible for the earned income tax credit. And we spend about $60 billion a year on it. It's a, it's a big tax expenditure for the income tax credit. So with that sort of um, background, what we know about the earned income tax credit is the following. And really, this um, policy change in 1993 took place as a greater um, you know, welfare reform movement whereby you know, Clinton um, uh, 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 ran for office on the statement that you know, if you work, you won't be poor. Um, and it was very much a movement away from cash welfare and towards this more in-work support model that was being promoted at that time and is still sort of the, the backbone of the American social safety net today. And so a very important part about the earned income tax credit and very much in contrast to more traditional cash welfare support is that you know, the EITC is an in-work benefit and you don't get the EITC if you don't work. So simple economics says that the EITC should increase employment because you're, you're incentivizing it. That's part of the point of the program. And so very, very many studies have analyzed this and show very large, robust relationship when the EITC gets more generous, especially for single parent families that are about uh, two-thirds of EITC recipients because they have lower income levels on average, um, their employ the employment rates of that group increase substantially. And so a really important part of the EITC and sort of what I want to leave you with is being the a, a, a incr incredibly important part of our social safety net is that the EITC reduces poverty through two channels. One, we're giving people money. That obviously, should reduce poverty. But it turns out equally important is the fact that we're encouraging work in the process. And so family income goes up because earnings go up, as well as the credit is providing additional resources in the family. And it turns out that, that that's quantitatively important. So to step back for a second and say, what do the elements of our social safety net do for poverty? These are the standard statistics that are released by the census. So this is for children, and it calculates how many more children would be poor if, one at a time, each one of these social safety net programs were erased. But it's a static calculation that assumes nothing else changes. Importantly, your earnings, and I'm going to come back to that. But taking it at face value, what this points out, and this is for the most recent data that this data is available for <clears throat> 2013, is that the EITC is the biggest anti-poverty program for children in the United States. So almost five million children are removed from poverty because of the EITC. The next most important feature of the social safety net and something that you know, I've also done a lot of work on is SNAP or CalFresh. Um, and it's, a, it's even more important if you look at extreme poverty as opposed to um, uh, regular poverty. And then just compared to that, you can see all the other elements of the social safety net and, and their relative uh, importance for reducing poverty. In contrast, if we look at adults, not children, and drop seniors, what is kind of amazing is even if you exclude seniors, but just look at adults, the most important anti-poverty program in the United States is Social Security. Um, and part of that is when we count income, we count everybody in the family. So you, know, you can't really say this is a non-senior because there could be a senior in the household and their income would be contributing to it. And also this source of income includes disability income as, as part of Social Security. So Social Security is really important, even if you exclude the senior population. But in addition, so I, I mentioned that, so the EITC is the biggest anti-poverty program, but it's a, it's a static calculation. So I said before that, you know, we've got this effect whereby the EITC encourages more work. Well, that's not part of this 4.7 million. So I have some recent work that shows that the anti-poverty effects of the EITC, if you take into account that earnings channel, are maybe twice as big 
as what the, the standard uh, government statistic calculations are. So in other words, having a social safety net program that provides resources while providing incentives to uh, add people to the labor market turns out to be a pretty important combination. Now admittedly, in the Great Recession, if you don't have work, you don't have an EITC, and it's, the EITC is not <clears throat> the only program we need, because you need work in order to get the earned income tax credit, and of course, that's not been the easiest thing to have, <clears throat> excuse me, in the last period of time. But let me then just end by talking a little bit about the Great Recession, at least kind of on a national level. So, you know, poverty goes up in recessions. You know, we so, sort of saw that before. But what's really important, and I'll just, this will be the last graph that I show you, is that the social safety net can really make a difference. And so what do I have on this graph? Each one of these dots is a state. I probably should have labeled it so you could see what they are. But on the x-axis is, in the Great Recession, how much did the unemployment rate go up in that state? So California, we had one of the higher increases in, uh, in unemployment, we're, we're somewhere in here. On the y-axis is, in that state, how much did child poverty go up in the Great Recession? And for a moment, just look at the black dots. The black dots calculate poverty ignoring the social safety net. So it just calculates private income, so your earnings, um, and other, you know, maybe returns, any other kinds of non-labor income that you have, child support, alimony, those sorts of things. And what you can see is that, you know, we've got this upward sloping line. The larger the un unemployment rate increased, the greater poverty went up in your state. But in contrast, the blue circles show the poverty rate after all the elements of the social safety net, after SNAP, after uh, the EITC and everything else. And the point is that, well, of course, the poverty rates are going to be lower once you add in the social safety net, by definition. But not only that, importantly, this line is flatter. And the difference in the slope between the black line and the blue line sort of quantify that the social safety net is providing insurance. So poverty rates went up by less in the high labor market shock states compared to the low labor market shock states once we build in the social safety net, because the social safety net is designed to try to fill in for those losses in income. So this is sort of a, a takeaway about the fact that you know, the social safety net did do something, and poverty rates would have gone up by a whole lot more, obviously, uh, if we didn't have that social safety net in place. But it's sort of easy to forget that. So I would be... Uh, more than happy to, to take any questions, but the takeaway is that the labor market's important. Um, the social safety net can do a lot of good, uh, but we, have, we can't forget about the importance of the, of the labor market as a sort of fundamental driver of well-being for, you know, all working uh, families, the higher income families and, and the lower income families. So thank you very much. <laughs>
giving the wrong or take, um, studying the wrong areas or can you yeah. comment on that? I think it's a, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think everybody hears that um, and I think it's missing something really important and that is if you compare what's going on for, like I have a 21 year old, I'm familiar with this sort of phenomenon, although she's got one more year of school, so I'm waiting for her to come back home, um, <laughs> is that what is happening to those kids who don't have a college degree? And I don't have it up here, but the unemployment rate for recent college graduates and is, is not zero. And it's higher today than it has been, and at this point, we can't tell the difference between the holdover from the Great Recession and whether there, we might be on some new path. I think we just don't know yet. But the point is, what would their circumstances be if they hadn't gone to school? And the unemployment rate is about four times as high. So I think what's often missed in all of this is that, is that we're in a situation now where even kids with skills are not necessarily getting their dream jobs right out of school, and that's certainly more of a phenomenon today. But there is absolutely no evidence from the most recent data we can collect that college is not a good investment. It, the investment, you know, and that, the fact that the wages are overall going up for college educated relative to non-college educated workers tells you that there's still a huge return. It's just what we're observing right now is a slower transition than we would have seen 10 years ago into those earning jobs. But at this point, we have no evidence that the value to a college degree has gone down, though importantly, the cost of a college degree has gone up. But still, if you sort of take that into account, the rate of return, so labor economists spend a lot of time measuring what is the rate of return to a college degree, it hasn't gone down, and that builds in the cost, which is basically, but it's hard to see that when you see your own anecdotes, and so I think that's where it's useful to sometimes go up to 30,000 feet. Yeah? So you do a lot of comparisons to Europe, and um, so one of the, the big differences to um, the, the company pay structure in Europe is that the, the ratio of the, the top earners in the company to the, to the lowest earners right. is, um, is not as large, by far not as large as right. it is in the United States. Right. Even for companies that have holdings in both here in the US and in Europe and do very similar work. And um, that, you know, that obviously does, does a huge part in you know, bringing up the, you know, the, the yep. second and the, the third yep. tier, even if the jobs have stayed the same. Yep. But uh, you know, in terms of your policy suggestions, I, you know, I just see the, the same old, same old and, and not anything that would really turn around the, you know, the way that, the, you know, that, that basically capitalism as it is at work in the United States versus the countries in Europe that you're comparing to. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you, know, you bring up a good point, and, and to sort of turn back the clock a little bit, the United States looked more like its European <coughs> counterparts on precisely that variable, the ratio of the top to the bottom within the firm, not very long ago. Yeah. So we've not always been different, but mm -hmm. we're very different today. And I think people haven't figured out how to, how to do that. People haven't figured out how to change that. So the, the size of the pie, the, the re returns that the firms are getting are growing and growing and growing, but the slice that are going to the non-top workers is, is not gaining. But if you're putting and so that's where the bargaining comes in. And but you know I don't have the I don't have the silver bullet for that. Mm -hmm. um, but you raise an important point: how much of this has to do with culture? How much of this has to do with differences in Americans liking inequality or be willing to tolerate it, as opposed to other countries not wanting to tolerate it? And that's kind of you know equally comes with the much higher marginal tax rate in many of these countries as a way to try to create some of this equilibration that the United States doesn't seem to want to have. Yeah, so that is part of it, but then also the pay structure in the companies themselves, right? right? And very right. socially acceptable. Right, but the pay structures yeah. are partly related to the tax structure. So if the tax is going to be very high, there's going to be less kind of incentive to, to have those high wages because you get to keep less of it. If, but but still, it, your point is still completely valid that I wish I had the solution for, but right. don't. 
Yeah. And I was just going to say that unemployment has gone down in Santa Clara County, and homelessness has gone up. And mm. even if wages doubled, we would still see that people wouldn't afford rent because it's yeah, it's skyrocketed, right? Yeah. So what is, is there some policy or something we can do around rent? Also for small businesses. So if you keep raising the wage, which I'm an advocate for, then you're going to have small businesses just not be able to afford it to pay for their employees. Yeah, so you mean like increasing minimum wages? Which which is great, but it has to right. increase rent. Right. Right. You have to have both working together. Um, right. We see that unemployment has gone down, but right. again, I mean, down. you know, on the one hand, making pitches for increases in wages does not come at the expense of, of some things. Now, on the one hand, if wages are being increased across the board, then at least small businesses that are competing with big firms, they're going to be on equal footing in terms of the cost of labor. Um, but it, it, you know, how we think about increases in wages at the bottom and how it relates to jobs and so on, in part depends on whether the firms that are hiring these workers are who they're competing with. Are they competing with, you know, restaurants and other kind of retail establishments are competing with other restaurants and retail establishments or sometimes purchases that can be made over the web and so on. But it's kind of takes a very different flavor when you're talking about the price of workers, say in a manufacturing industry where they might be competing with workers overseas that don't have these kind of regulations in place. So sort of how we think about increasing wages and what it means for the availability of jobs sort of depends. But more importantly to our local economy, and especially right here where I sit, is the dramatic concern about changes in, in the cost of living. And that, you know, the, I guess the only thing I showed about that was just how dramatically California shoots up as being a high poverty state when we take that into account. And so I think cities are trying to figure out what to do about this. I mean, to the extent to which they're trying to build more um, low, uh, you know, housing that's affordable, or the extent to which, you know, a very small number of communities are trying to consider something around some kind of rent stabilization. I mean, that's 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 what we have available to us. Um, the other kinds of opportunities is is building out the transportation infrastructure so it's easier to get people in um, from the areas that are further out. Um, and are lower cost, uh, but that requires better transportation infrastructure. Um, so those aren't cheap solutions, uh, either one of them, but I think it's what places are grappling with right now, and I think we're sort of ground zero on that, given the incredible strength at one part of the labor market in the Bay Area, and very notably down here in Santa Clara County. Well, one of the figures you highlight when you talk about the impact, the, you know, you, you looked at the supplemental poverty measure. Yeah. And you talk about, you know, how kind of it, it came close, basically, you know, came back down to yeah. the absolute, you know, poverty, uh, poverty measure. I was kind of surprised to see that. Um, oh, that it came down? Well, no, not that, not that it came down, but the fact that, I mean, I would have, I would have assumed that supplemental poverty measure would actually show uh, like a greater gain or actually better than, than the actual poverty measure ah, because of, it, because right. of the, the impact of social supports right. that are part of that. You know? And I don't know if you could kind of help help understand it because like when we see the impact of social supports in this region, we see the poverty level goes down right. because of uh, a range of different things. And I'm right. wondering if, uh, like if you could kind of expand upon that and comment on uh, what has happened to a frame of the social safety net? Like, have we actually seen declines? You said EITC has gone up tremendously, right. but uh, other forms of social support. So yeah. It, it, SNAP went up, obviously, during the recession. Right. But uh, have you seen some of that trend or <coughs> have you seen that value? I'm, 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 curious, yeah. about, I'm cur curious about your thoughts on that, because I would have assumed that things are perhaps better because of that. Or right. is it just that we're just capturing the, the, uh, the differences in cost of living? Yeah. I, I think when you think about the supplemental poverty measure versus the official poverty measure, or with either one of them, my own view is it's much more important to think about the change from year to year than what the actual number is. I mean, I know the number is important, you know, obviously. But in terms of what it means and what we want to think about our policies, I, I think more about wh where it's going. So I think the problem is so many things changed in the supplemental poverty measure that it's not just one includes more social support, so therefore the poverty rate should be lower, because it also changed the thresholds, and the thresholds went way up. And so it just turns out that the net effect was to not change poverty by very much. But I think that's missing the important point that if you were to break it down, and I didn't show you this, by group, 
the poverty rate for children actually went up <coughs> by, I mean, the poverty rate for seniors went up by a lot more than the poverty rate for children and the switch from one to the other. In fact, the poverty rate for children did come down a little bit. The poverty rate for seniors went up because, I didn't even mention it, but the other thing a supplemental poverty measure does is deduct an out-of-pocket cost of medical care because that's kind of a, like a non-discretionary expense. That's how it's justified. And because that those are not small for seniors, it turns out that that pushes up their poverty. And so it just turns out that that overall, the fact that they're about the same, masks a tremendous amount of movement within different groups. So I'm just wondering if there's a, be a better way of being able to illustrate, you know, for those of us that are uh, yeah. working on this, to yeah. illustrate the, the positive effect of, of, yeah. of either income supports or Well, I think this is, what, this is what's cited. So you take your supplemental poverty measure, you say, okay, we got this new thing. And this new thing incorporates these important parts of the social safety net that were not incorporated in the old one. And just live in the new one and say, what would happen? And this is what, you know, at least nationally, what places like Center for Budget and Policy Priorities is pushing out every day. Like just yesterday, I got something in my inbox. The amount of, you know, the, the, the effect of the social safety net is even bigger than you thought. Um, and they had a little piece about that. So I think this is what people do to basically say, look what happens when we when we kind of get, imagine eliminating parts of the social safety net. And then to answer your other question, I mean, I, I've, done, I've really dug into the data from the Great Recession, and it's very clear, very clear, that welfare reform concretely has led to less protection at the very bottom. And I'm sure that anyone in this room who works a lot closer to clients than I do so, yeah, it's classic professor, like telling you something I already know. But it shows up in the aggregate data. So extreme poverty is defined as income below 50% of poverty. And while everything I've been talking about here is normal 100% of poverty, it really does miss the fact that at the bottom, things in the Great Recession went up by much more than we would have expected, given prior patterns from history. And from everything that I've been able to try to dig into to understand why that's the case, it's totally because programs like CalWORKs or TANF nationally did nothing in the Great Recession. And in prior downturns, it would have gone up. And so clients are not going to CalWORKs. It is not seen as a, people don't see it as a, you know, if you need a job to be on CalWORKs and you don't have a job and that's why you're not working, why should I go on CalWORKs? That, that's kind of the, you know, a perception. But it aggregates up to really being evident in the national statistics. So my opinion is one of the most critical parts of the safety net that's gone that we really need to work on. So I'm positive. So I talked about the EITC, but the real negative pieces at the very bottom were, were, were in worse shape than we were before. And I think it's because that floor is not there anymore. And SNAP's doing its best to make up for it, but it's not enough. People used to get SNAP and cash welfare when they weren't working, and now they don't get cash welfare. Their incomes are lower. And that's very evident in the national statistics. And, I, and I'm seeing this data being used nationally to say, let's eliminate the lower effect. Of, like, instead of it saying, right. let's look at how do we how do you no, that's more effective. Right. So you say, well, if TANF isn't let's doing get, anything, let's just get rid of it. Forget about TANF, forget right. about LIHE, forget about you know, WIC, or like right. unemployment insurance, instead of rethinking right. unemployment insurance. And I, th I, mean, I think you're absolutely, I think you're, I mean, I think you're and right. I think some of the stuff would be dangerous, you know, right. like to not be able to talk about yeah. the positive net impact of, right. of these social supports and how these have been eroded. I, I take your point. I think, I think, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think that we should, I, I should be more thinking more about how to play some defense against that. So I think what's commonly done is, instead of looking at the poverty rate, people look at what's called the poverty gap, which is how many dollars do you need to get everybody up to poverty in a kind of aggregate sense? And that's a little bit more, like that would show that TANF is doing a lot more, and that's part of what this thing that just came in my inbox yesterday was, was about extreme poverty and about the fact that, well, okay, so not many people are on TANF, but for those who are, it's incredibly important. And it's still touching two million people, and that's not zero. So I think there are ways to use that information, and I, I really appreciate the comment because I stand up here and I say these things, and you don't always think about how the message gets there. So I, I appreciate that comment and, and think it's spot on. Yeah. I'd like to follow up on that. This is from the Kingdom of Senior Citizens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
that social security yeah. power is... We'll just point uh, to this because it's yeah, closer it's to very, the very, very significant because uh, in, in fewer than 15 years, there's going to be an infusion of 65 year and older people right. thanks to the retirement of 71.4 million yep. baby boomers. Yep. And so the concern right now, and what you read in all the senior publications, yeah. is uh, social What's gonna security happen? Right. may well, and they're talking about, may well disappear. Because you have, I mean, first of all, the fastest growing segment of the population yep. is 90 plus. You need to know that you're all young, <laughs> and may you live that long, Right. but 90 plus. And so you think about the numbers of people, 20% of the U.S. population in fewer than 15 years, 20% will be 65 and over. Right. Now look at that Social Security bar and think about it, because it may not be there to help keep the children right. out of the poverty gap, so right. where do you go? So I think the answer to that is actually a pretty discouraging one, and actually it's Medicare is the much bigger problem. I mean, Social Security is it's a very predictable, we know what that, everything you just said is exactly right, and we know it's coming, and we can even do the calculations now. There's not that many uncertainties. It's just, okay, exactly when are people going to retire, but we know how big that cohort is going to be. And so I think that the, the calculations show that we wouldn't have to make very much of a change to Social Security today to keep it solid for, I think they project out 50 years, for, for the 50-year horizon. So I think that that is a policy that everybody thinks is eminently solvable, as long as we don't wait too long and don't wait the 15 years until we're in much worse shape. Um, but I think the much the bigger concern is Medicare, because in addition to the demographics, as you point out, it's also the cost of medical care on top of that. And Medicare, unlike Social Security, fully one half of the cost of Medicare comes out of general funds. Most people don't know that. You sort of think it's just like Social Security, which is you know, it's a pay-as-you-go. The current, the current workers pay for the current <coughs> seniors. So Medicare, only half of it works that way. The other half comes out of general funds, and that's the way it's always been. So it actually is a much more concerning piece because it's not funded by the payroll tax. And, as we all know, you know, the cost of medical care is, is a, an additional factor on top of it. So I think that if we had a reasonable Congress, it would be pretty straightforward to try to address Social Security. It would, and, and us current workers would bear the burden of that um, to a large extent. Uh, but yes. Medicare is harder. That is, you can't just, uh, you know, increase the payroll tax rate to try to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. So one last question. Yeah. You are. Oh yeah. Uh, First and last, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> the, the, you put Ms. Mudd emphasis on the EITC. Yeah. It's not new money, it's a form of income transfer. At what point does it become, because of the U-shaped curve that you pointed out, at what point does EITC become a burden on the uh, general fisc? Yeah. That's a good question. It sounds a little bit like Romney's statement, that famous statement, right? Like, everybody's just a taker, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't, just thought I would say that. Just, <laughs> just, just to lighten it a little bit. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're right. I mean, so the question is, are we willing to pay to try to create, I can say it because I'm not an elected official, redistribution. Well, see, that's Personally, <laughs> I'm more than willing to pay a high marginal tax rate in order to facilitate redistribution. But the deeper question is, how many, what share of the population needs to be the recipient of that? And I think that's really at the core of what you're saying. If we're losing the gain in the middle of the distribution, will the EITC have to go out to the media? And then that starts to be a bigger concern. So I mean, I think, I think you're you're right to raise that as a concern. I don't think that's a threat in America. Well, it's but a threat because if the focus on corporate America, like Silicon Valley, is excessive rewarding of CEOs right. to do things other than worry about their employees, right? Then uh, at some point the EITC has to succumb, right? Because we've got policies that uh, say the one percent is entitled to all the money, and the rest right. of you guys. You're on your own. Right. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs>
hopefully we're not going to get there. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah.